Welcome back to another episode of the Startup Therapy Podcast. This is Ryan Rutan, joined as always by Will Schroeder, my friend, the founder and CEO of Startups.com. Will, uh, you know, we talk a lot about bootstrapping. The entire startup world is starting to talk a bit more about bootstrapping, which we're really <laughs> happy about because we do want people to remember that funding is not the only path to success with a startup company. But then it begs the question, how do I actually pay for all this shit if I'm bootstrapping? How does this <laughs> actually work? right? Cool. I'm not going to go raise money, but how do I pay for things with money I don't have is the lingering question that we're always left with. You know, I'm tired of not answering it, right? right? I'm tired of saying, well, everybody bootstraps. <laughs> everybody and bootstraps. Everybody does it. Figure it out. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's this weird thing is, is we just say bootstrapping as it's as if it's this magic pixie dust. But if we right. just say bootstrapping, you're like, oh, there is that pile of money I didn't know. Oh, hang on. It's right next to my Amex. It's the bootstrap. There there it is. I've got it. I found it. I got my bootstrap. And it's become this overused, um, almost like totally amorphous term to mean you don't have money. Right. Right. And it's like, how useless is that as feedback? And I say that as a guy who gives that feedback and I'm tired all of giving time. that feedback. Yep. Right. We I'm do tired this of giving all the time. Because I know what it means. You know what it means. But I'm... 99% certain the people that we're talking to just look at us going, yeah, great. <laughs> you solved nothing for me. Go continue to not have money and not buy things and not Yeah, yeah, forward. like, Thanks. great. You, you, you and your magical bootstrapping. Today, I want to dig into exactly what we mean when we say pay for things without money, right? How do I hire people? How do I uh, be able to do things like launch marketing, which is like one of the first things I'm going to raise money for anyway? Um, how do I pay for all the stuff, right? Because it's cool that I'm, quote, bootstrapping, but what does that actually mean? Yeah. So we'll dig in today. We'll talk about those different categories. We'll talk about the actual um, techniques that folks use, like how it's actually done, what's worked for us, what works for other people. We'll let you know this is what you can do. And specifically, here's what you can't. There's plenty of things. There's plenty of limitations here. Yeah, because there are a couple of do not flies. Yeah, do not do this. Yep. Let's set it up just by at a high level, um, talking about where the challenges are kind of in this space. Now, everybody knows I don't have money, right? Yep. Check. Okay. Uh, okay. That's clear. But what we're really saying is I know I need like $500,000 to capitalize this business, to pay my, my salary, to pay for a couple of the people and get shit done. There's nothing you're going to tell me in this podcast that's going to show me how to get five hundred thousand dollars with you know w without an investor, et cetera. And you are a hundred percent right. You are not getting five hundred thousand dollars, right? The first thing I want to start off with: that's not how this works, right? Part of what we're implying when we say bootstrapping is trying to figure out how to beg, borrow, steal, which we're going to talk about specifically um, for tiny milestones. That, that's where I want to start things off. Right. If you're like, oh, we need 500 k to do the whole thing. It doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. Yeah. I think that's the that's the biggest misconception in bootstrapping is that I need two million dollars to go build my product, begin marketing, hire a team, and do all this other stuff and have 18 months of runway. And so you say bootstrap, okay, cool. Then I have to bootstrap two million. That is not at all. I know you just said this, but I'm gonna reiterate that's not what we're talking about. When we go to bootstrap mode, we are talking about getting really nitty gritty with the calculus around. What is the next thing I desperately need to just move an inch forward? We're buying our way to the finish line an inch and a dollar at a time, not big tranches of fund. That's that's called funding, right? This is not funding. I'm going to remind everybody, bootstrap is not funding, right? So we're going to talk about the not funded path here. You touched on something that's super important in kind of how I wanted to frame this. This is about operating week to week. This is about operating week to week. I'm, I, and I don't want to even say hand to mouth, use one of these bizarre euphemisms that doesn't have an actual context to it. We are planning, spending, executing, and returning on a seven day window. Yep. Okay. We're making decisions within seven days. Why? Because that's all we can afford. That's how far we can look out. And if that, if that seems small minded, if that seems like, well, uh, what a shitty way to run a business, it is later. Yeah. It is later, right? If you're seven years into it and you're still doing that, things haven't gone well. Just, just <laughs> yeah. office, okay. Take the boots off. Go home. I, exactly. What where you're at now, um, you know, in the, in the very formative stages, is you're just learning. 
You're just trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B as fast as inefficiently as possible. So again, let's go back to the three categories that we'll cover. We'll start with the first one, which is people. Then we'll get into marketing. And then we'll get into what I'm just going to collectively uh, refer to as stuff, just everything else yep. you need. How do we pay for people? Uh, Ryan, when when you talk to folks and it's like, hey, I need to bring this person on, developer, whatever, what do you tell them? Yeah. Okay. I think it depends. It depends on, you know, the, the the situation depends on what that next milestone is. How far are we from being able to generate cash with that decision? There's a lot of things that go into it, but at, at the high level, you know, there's, there's a couple ways that we can do this. And I think the two that you and I probably recommend most often are some version of equity or deferred comp, right? This is where, this is where we're going to start. Um, equity deferred comp, or in some cases, depending on who you are and what you do, there may be some horse trading that can be done. There may be some bartering. I have certainly in the past done work for people and gotten their work in return. They need something I need. I can, we can, we can do a horse trade. Those are the three, right? And actually in order of preference, it would be the reverse order. I would love to barter time for time um, so that I can get what I need without parting with, with equity or without stacking up debt in terms of deferred comp. I would say in terms of ease. Um, deferred comp is often an easier sell because it, look, equity is a form of deferred comp anyways. Yeah, it is. But it's a it's a form of deferred comp with a much lower likelihood of an actual payout. Whereas if you're just promising to pay somebody, then right. they assume, rightfully so, that someday you are going to pay. Them. Right. Of course. And here, here's the way I would look at it. When when we say to somebody that it's, it's always, I need to hire a developer, right? And I don't have any money. So I'm going to go raise money, but I can't, investors won't talk to me. And by the way, that that's why they won't talk to you because you're supposed to have been able to figure this stuff out yep. before you get to them. They don't just give you a magic check and say, okay, now you don't have to worry about anything. It just doesn't work that way, right? Now, again, you also don't know that because you've never gone through this before. So none of this makes sense, which is why we unpack this stuff. So first things first, we need to find this developer. What what are we going to say to them? Okay, we find a developer, you know, let's say some random place like Upwork or something like that. And we reach out to him and say, hey, I've got this project. I don't have any cash up front and I understand cash is king. I get it, right? Not not um, masking that fact. However, here's what I would like to do. I'd like to be able to get to this tiny milestone, not build the whole product, tiny milestone, just so I can have something to show either customers, investors, et cetera. And for your time and investment, you'll get uh, X amount of stock, right? Yep. Usually a very small amount of stock, a lot if you're doing it all wrong. And you're like, why would anybody agree to that? Yes, and that is how most companies get built. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it sounds really difficult, and yet somehow it still happens every day, day in, day out. You you made a great point here. I want to stick on it for a second, which is that uh, too often what we see is somebody pitch like, yeah, and we've we told the the horror stories around this, around like you know you you need you need to get some little feature developed. We need to get an MVP or a proof of concept app out the door. Uh, something really basic. And what do they end up doing? Giving away a bunch of equity and bringing on a CTO, who it turns out was just a relatively run-of-the-mill junior developer who's now your CTO. You can see how well that ends and you gave a bunch of equity to do it. Cool and cool. So I think that there's two things about this. I think that when you make a mountain out of a molehill and you're like, we have all these crazy things to do, here's what we're building. Because we get so used to pitching the vision that we pitch way too much and we make it sound like a lot of work because it is, but it's all undefined. We don't really know what we're doing long term. We have no idea what we're actually going to end up building at the end. And so we over pitch the, the 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 workload for what we actually need for right now. For if we're thinking about in terms of a week, we're pitching them three, five, ten years worth of development. And we're like, right. what we actually need is a feature by next week. So we oversell it. So then we have to overbuy. So now we have to bring them on as like a full CTO. We have to give up way more equity because you're going to do all this stuff. Yep. Whereas if you're just like, hey, I need to release this feature by by like you know two weeks from now, and like I, you've got the skill set to do it. Uh, what if I kicked you a little equity or some deferred comp? Right, that's a much easier conversation to have. You're much more likely to get a yes because they're looking at it going, yeah, for them that'd be really difficult. For me, that's like three or four hours worth of work. Cool, right? I don't need to be a partner in your company to do three or four hours of work. Um, you don't want me as a partner in your company to do three or four hours of work. So I, I think it's important to make sure that we're right sizing the ask and the give. Um, and and buying what we actually need with the person we need at that time. That that is exactly it, right? So if if I only need two months worth of work, why am I trying to hire a full time CTO to quit their job to come work for me? Right? Just to your point, hire what you need. If you need a date to the prom, don't send out marriage proposals. Yeah, exactly. You're you're overselling it. 
Also, if you, if this person can't get past this first milestone of delivering something in two months, who cares how committed they are after that? Because they suck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You'll be really happy they don't have 30% of your cap table at that point. Right, right. There's this great story by uh, Felix Dennis, who is the founder of Maxim Magazine, uh, The Week, a bunch of biz- bizarre stuff. But he's this crazy guy um, that's lived this incredible life. He's passed since then, but uh, he lived this incredible life. And he wrote a bunch of books. Uh, toward the end of his life. And one of the books he wrote was called How to Get Rich, right? And I love the title. It's it's so spot on, right? But he's this like quirky Brit and like he uh, talks about his life in a very bizarre way. When he first started back like in the, the early 70s, one of the things he wanted to do was create a, uh, a, a comic book. He tells the story about how he like went to each person in the production line, the writer, the graphic designers, the printers, everyone, right? The marketers. Yep. And what he said was, I found out what was important to each of them and I sold them that. Yep. That's exactly it. And he said, so I went to the writers and I said, you know, you'll get your byline on here in a way that you've always wanted. I went to the designers and I said, you'll be able to create something, draw something that you've wanted to draw. You'll have total license. Whereas before you're just like a person with a, with with a paintbrush. Right. Um, I went to the printer and I said, I'll pay more than you'll typically get on your rate. If you just defer the um, payment terms. Right. Yeah. And he's like, and that's how I paid for it. He said that at the time, I had deposited 50 pounds into um, uh, Lloyd's or, or wherever he was banking at the time. I think it was Lloyd's. Um, and he said within two years, that that turned into 500 million pounds. Or, I'm sorry, uh, 60,000 pounds, which I think he said was a, a half million dollars in today's uh, dollars, right? Yeah. And he's like, and I never had a penny. All he did was align what he needed with what other people's interests are. My problem is most people are too lazy to do that. They're too self better. It is. That's the hard part, right? You have to do. You have to do the investigative journalism. You got to dig in. You got to find out what is going to motivate these people. What What do they want to get from this? Because that's ultimately that's the that's what they're thinking on their side. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Uh, normally, if I work, there's cash in it for me. You have no cash, so what else is in it for me? And I love that story because it's it's exactly what bootstrapping is about. Bootstrapping isn't this like prescribed particular path around you always pay for developers this way, you always pay for marketing this way, you always do this this way. It's about looking at each situation and saying, in order to get to the very next milestone, I think you put it beautifully, What to get to next week, to get to keep playing this game, I have to win this round. How do I win this round? How do I win this hand at the table? Yep. And think about all the resources available to you and what is the scrappiest way I can get to that result with what I have, knowing cash isn't one of those things. Yep. This is what's constantly happening in Bootstrap. Right? It's a crazy, crazy process that I don't know has ever looked exactly the same twice. And we've done this number and number of time and time again, right? Well, it's how we build our businesses. And it's never looked exactly the same. That underlying principle has always been the same. How do I make sure I'm not asking for anything more than I need at any given time? And I mean this across the board, like it from the, you know, the, my own desires with what I want to have happen with the company. Did I make that next milestone small enough? Did I make it short enough? Right. If you're thinking like, here's what you need to accomplish in the next three months. Bullshit. Again, break that down. What do I need to accomplish by next week? Because if I don't get to next week, three months is a pipe dream, right? Seems like a short amount of time, but not when you have to pass next week to get there. So break things down and don't chase any more than you absolutely need to get to that next level. I agree. And look, it, the other side of this too is um, it's understanding what would equate somebody wanting to take risk, okay? So let's, let's back that up just for a second because it's so important. Um, if we're trying to hire, uh, let's say a, a person uh, doubles with marketing, right? Um, and And we're like, why would they possibly help us with our social media? They're great at doing social media, but why would they possibly help us? Well, let's break it down. Uh, number one, is there some way that they could wind up making more than they'd ever make doing this for what they normally uh, get paid, right? Um, which is usually the promise of equity. It could be the promise of uh, uh, shared revenue, you know, at, at, per this campaign. That's what that's what Felix Dennis did. He said, hey, if this comic sells well, Mr. Printer, you're going to get more than you've ever gotten before, right? That was appealing. The second is, um, is there some way this would help you and or your career? How many people do you know that are doing what they want to do, what they want to do, right? Not what they're good at, right? What they want to do. Uh, artists are a great example, right? Every time I've been employed an artist, you know, because we used to own an agency, so we had an awful lot of artists. Um, it was always, 
they're doing medical journal ads. I guarantee they didn't go to art school for that, right? It sucks. It pays well, really well, right? But it sucks. Um, so you come to them and you say, what would you love to be doing? Right. Right. If you had it your way, you can wake up tomorrow and your job as a creative, your job as a social media marketer would be what you want to do. What would that look like? And by the way, be smart enough to even to ask that question, right? Uh, care about them, it's fundamental empathy, um, more so than yourself. They will tell you. <laughs> They're yep. like, dude, I'm stuck doing these lame campaigns. Like I'm doing social media right now, you know, uh, hypothetically for um, real estate companies, right? Not exciting. No. I want to do social media for fashion, right? Yep. You're like, cool, I'm a fashion brand, right? Like now you get to do it for fashion. I don't think people understand, founders, how few people get to do what they actually want to do. And if you are the opportunity to enable that for somebody, you are God. You are. And it can come in a lot of forms. I helped somebody sometime, around this time last year actually, needed, uh, they they had great technical founding skills, great leadership skills, had, had zero understanding of how to market anything. Just did not get it, didn't understand it. It was one of those skill sets that was like, I just don't, I don't understand it, I don't get it. I'm hearing what you're saying. I don't know how to go do that. We need a someone. And so I introduced him to somebody I knew was looking to start doing fractional CMO work because they wanted to be a fractional CMO because they were tired of being a marketing director in the agency that they were in and they, they wanted to do something else. So they wanted to, to upskill that uh, career, but they needed some social proof that they could actually do this. So they took that project on for free, helped them build their go-to-market strategy and a, their first couple of social media and paid uh, media campaigns. And they got to say, I'm a fractional CMO for this company. Right, they've gone on now to pick up other clients. So there, there's so many of these opportunities. I think I'm just thinking now, well, just like the delta between when we started doing this, how much easier bootstrapping is now. I'm not, it's not easy. I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy, but in terms of being able to find the right fit, right time, right place, resources, it's night and day. I mean, you and I were stuck like stomping around the the 270 circle trying to find people that had the skills and had the time and wanted the thing. Right, it was a lot harder to do unless they wanted Damon's ribs. Um, <laughs> I happen to have a tab, um, right? So I think that it's uh, it's the case now that we we can find these situations because we're so much more exposed to so many people and what they want thanks to the old internet. Yeah, well, the other thing um, as far as there are lots of ways to pay people, do not forget about a title. Yeah, yeah. Right? That, I go to that a was it in this case. That's what this yeah, person wanted. I go to a 22-year-old developer and I say, I understand you are line level, like almost intern level developer or wherever you're at now. At my company, you're the CTO, right? Do not underestimate the value. And by the way, that does have real value. It does have real value to that person. It does. Uh, also be very careful because it can have real consequences when all of a sudden a junior developer is your CTO if you get tied into that. Oh, sure. But, but I mean, it, it wasn't everybody a, 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 an unqualified CTO of like literally every tech company that's ever existed. Pretty much. Right. You know what I'm saying? I just like, it's kind of the standard fare. But what I'm saying is often when we say CTO, we're referring at CTO at a major company. In other words, the title, right, is usually like, like we associate it with a major company um, that it's with, right? So when somebody says, I'm the CTO, they never think to themselves, oh, wait, but I'm a CTO of a two-person company, so I make like $25,000 a year. The, the, the value of it to them is I'm a CTO, ergo... I'm point for point with those people in, in bigger um, jobs. Not saying I know what they know, but I have the gravitas of that type, right? Same with the CEO. Don't overlook that. You go to a junior level person and you say, in my organization, you got a, a VP level title, a C level title. They will salivate over that. It's all they'll tell their friends about, their parents, everybody, right? Um, it costs you nothing. No, but I argue you don't even have to go that far. If you can level them up to whatever the next career rung is, especially if this is, if this, I think, I think depending on whether you want this to be a long-term engagement or short-term engagement, right? If this is something you know is going to be a couple of months and they're going to necessitously move on to something else, because again, like you can only, you, you're not, you're not paying them anything. You don't know when you'll be able to pay them. You're paying them with a title that they can leverage into their next job. Then, then, you know, giving them something like a, you know, go from junior to senior developer or senior developer to director, something along those lines. Um, doesn't have to be the the full on jump. In fact, for for their own career progression, might be better because of course people are going to look at the resume. Like you were a junior developer at at uh, at an Amazon subsidiary, and now you're a CTO. 
Um, and now you're applying for a mid-level programmer role. So we don't, we, we're having trouble sorting out. So just even from, from their perspective can often be better to just like a couple rungs up. Doesn't cost you as much. Doesn't cost them anything. Just senior in the title. Yep. Right. I mean, it can buy you more, but it is, it is a great conversation starter, right? Like, how'd you like to be a senior developer? Well, I'd love to. And not overlook, right? Because you generally don't get the opportunity to just go do that. Just like level up your title arbitrarily. The last piece of this puzzle that I want to talk about is do not overlook the novelty of new, right? In other words, work on something new and exciting. Most people are working on stuff that they're bored out of their mind with. They hate their jobs. They hate the work that they're doing. They're bored. I meet like so few people and even think of the industry we're in where we live and breathe startups where I meet people that, let's say, aren't the CEO, but even though I, I, I apply it there as well, where I'm like, um, is this the most exciting thing you could be working on or, or does it excite you? And the answer is almost always no. You know, something that's really funny about everything we talk about here is that none of it is new. Everything you're dealing with right now has been done a thousand times before you, which means the answer already exists. You may just not know it, but that's okay. That's kind of what we're here to do. We talk about this stuff on the show, but we actually solve these problems all day long at groups.startups.com. So if any of this sounds familiar, stop guessing about what to do. Let us just give you the answers to the test and be done with it. Especially in today's day and age where we need so much stimulation. So just bringing something to the table that is novel and new is compelling as hell to way more people than you think. You know what's particularly compelling to super senior level people, right? Which is why they always say yes to being an advisor because they're like, dude, I, I'm mired in corporate bureaucratic political bullshit all day. All day. And now I get to use my brain thinking about something new and fresh and compelling and potentially world changing. Hell yes. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you went there. I'm glad you went to advisors specifically. And it doesn't have to be advisor necessarily, but I, I want to draw a distinction here. Um, particularly around this, there's an intersection here between this, the new and novel, right? I want to work on something that's different than what I'm normally doing and I can do it fractionally, right? In most cases, we don't need a 40 hour a week person. Said differently, we can't afford one anyway. So you'll take what you can get, right? <laughs> so if you can, if you can convince somebody that, Hey, it'd be really fun to go work on, like, I'm trying to figure out this new thing using AI prompting to do something else. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm actually super interested in that right now. Um, I, I'd love to help out. Cool. You want to be our strategic advisor or do you want to be our whatever, right? You can come up with something that's compelling from a title perspective, um, compelling from a, a work output perspective and an optics perspective out to the rest of the world. That's also gives you exactly what you need and gives them that creative or whatever outlet it is they're, they're looking for. And I, we see this happen all the time. Um, it's a great way to get, especially really small fractional uses of people's time, which again, often all we need right? Let's move on beyond people. Like uh, we've given sure. a, a lot of examples of that. Okay. Let's talk about marketing. Okay. I like marketing. Uh, I want to start with it with a, uh, once again, a, a little parable or story, um, about float, the magic yep. of float for folks that, 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 that means nothing to them. It simply means this float is what happens between the time that you incur an expense and the time that you pay it. It's called floating the difference. Okay. So you, you guys have all used Float because you've all used a credit card at some point, right? And you've paid for something, you've been given goods, and you've then paid for it in actual cash 30 days later when, whenever you paid off your credit card. That is Float. Now, most of the time, we don't think much of the value of that, right? Most of the time, we just think, oh, yeah, it's just convenient, right? When it comes to marketing, Float is everything. Float is everything. Let me demonstrate, again, uh, through a parable of, of how that works. In, um, in the 90s, Ryan, when you and I were running uh, agencies, um, a, a big part of how things worked, this was kind of pre-float, it was almost the opposite of float, actually. Um, a big part of how things worked was if you wanted to start a company, you paid cash in the barrel head for marketing, generally, and then you hoped you got customers back. Waited for some results. Yep. Correct, correct. Around the turn of the century, this really interesting thing happened um, called paid search. <laughs> what will later become AdWords, which, as you know, folks know, was stolen from, from Yahoo and more specifically Overture. What happened, and this was so fascinating to me at the time, was I could buy an ad on Google. I, I, when I say it like this, you know I'm kidding, right? I could buy an ad on Google now 
charge it to my Amex, and then the Amex bill would come like 30 days later and then give me like a 15 uh, day window to pay. So between the time I, I, I incurred the expense, somebody clicked, the time Google charged my card, then Amex ran my 30 days, then I had to pay the bill. I had like 45 to 60 days of flow. Why would anyone care about that? Well, we talk about marketing too. Uh, float is absolutely an important part of it for, for paid media. Um, there are also lots of other ways that we can we can fund our marketing, um, performance marketing being a, a major one of those where there's going to be some share in the proceeds, right? Plenty of shops out there that will do that, plenty of individuals you can do that with. You know, you can do things on on just a, a cost per acquisition basis, a cost per sale Billy basis, deals. a revenue share. There's all sorts of mechanisms that we can use within marketing, right? Go to somebody that has an email list that has an audience that wants what you have um, and test that, right? And yep. then you just, they, they get paid when you get paid. Will everybody say yes to that? No. Is any of this easy? No. So just go do the work, you know, put, put your shoes on, start stomping around, go find the people who will say yes to these things. But there are tons and tons of ways of doing this from, you know, uh, affiliate sales to uh, you know, full-on partnerships to uh, list swaps to you name it. There are ways to get these things done with very little or no cash um, that also don't require, because of course the other way with bootstrap marketing is the founder or, you know, the founding team is just doing it all themselves. We're like, well, we're just going to write scads of organic content and then wait a couple of years for it to rank. Um, and yeah, you can do that. But there are also ways uh, with, with zero cash that you can go out and, and begin to generate real, real revenue. Um, which I'm a huge fan of because if we want to go raise money to find out that advertising is not going to work, why would we want to do that? <laughs> like, why would we want to go give up equity in our company to get cash to find out it's not going to work? Right? If we can find out it's not going to work in a very short period of time, we'll find out that it does and then eliminate the need for funding. Which one of those paths sounds better to you? Think about all the different ways people have done this successfully. Um, Kickstarter was built on this. Kickstarter was built like, let's market it now. In this case, they had a platform to help people do it for free. But a lot of that, you know, wasn't on just Kickstarter. It was through social media campaigns. It was, you know, through a lot of other mechanisms. Um, but same concept. Let's collect money now and let's pay for it later. I mentioned briefly that um, terms is, you know, uh, you know what it was, what it's historically been called with your vendors. Sure. And your vendors say, we're willing to give you a, a, a window between when we give you the product and when you have to pay for it. I'll give you two examples. When I gave you the Felix Dennis example, uh, he was the founder of Maxim Magazine, The Week Magazine, et cetera. When he was starting that comic book, I mentioned he went to his printer and he said, I'll, I'll pay you more, but I need you to give me terms. In other words, I need you to tell me you'll print the damn comic book now, but you won't charge me for printing it for 90 days. That is the flow, right? And it's a magical form of capitalization. We all learned this in, in Popeye, man. Wembley will gladly pay you for Tuesday for a hamburger today, right? I'm not sure he ever paid up on this, but yeah, well, that's the other. <laughs> also gonna pay. The second one I always thought was uh, fascinating, although I don't know if it was a strategy or if it was just an outcome. My old old business partner uh, that you remember, Blaine, uh, we did Blue Diesel the first um, the, the agency with. Um, his dad started Cardinal Health, which for those that are unfamiliar and most people would be, it's like a hundred billion dollar company. Um, and one of the things that Cardinal did extremely well, which I always thought was hilarious, was not pay people. Now, now, <laughs> I say that Bob Walter, his dad, is probably killed me if you heard me say this. Um, but I just thought the strategy was brilliant. Hear me out. Where he basically just said, look, we will hit certain levels of scale where people have to do business with us. So they'll get paid when we get paid. Now, one of the things people always used to think was that the reason we did so well in healthcare back in the day was because Blaine's dad was, you know, essentially a billionaire and started this big company. And and the the little known fact that I always thought this was hilarious, those fuckers never paid us. <laughs> sure to their word, he never got paid from those guys. They would owe us money for the longest time, and I was always amazed at their resilience. They're like, look, we're huge. If you want to keep doing business with us, we'll pay you when we pay you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They were essentially making us finance them. Right. Which is how they yeah. became a multi-billion-dollar company, that's even it. at that stage. That's it. That's that's it. It's float of a different sort, but it's float nonetheless. Yep. Uh, and to them, it was worth billions of dollars to yes. put people off. Right. Yes, it strains relationships, but it also builds billion-dollar companies. You know, the float within marketing. You know, kind of bring this back. What we're really saying is, what can we implement 
so that we can get paid now vis-a-vis bring people in the door to, 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 um, to collect some cash so then we can pay it back later, okay? The, the notion, the default notion for people to understand this, which is most people, um, would be, no, 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 like I have to have a lot of money in the bank and I have to be able to buy marketing and maybe hope it'll work, but I have to pay for it, right? And, and when I say have to pay for it up front, I would stack rank, as anybody should, all of the different ways I can market and say, what can I do for free now? Newsletters, email, um, social, you know, some some level of SEO, that's like you said, deferred. And, you know, what kind of efforts required? I would then say, what are all the paid ways that I can instantly drive traffic um, or sales that I could find a way to pay for later post-sale? I don't think people understand, like, that's how you build a business. One of the more interesting tactics I've seen for this recently is this uh, this notion of like the the add on sale, right? So there's something I can tack on. You know, you also want to add this to your cart, right? And I'm using cart really broadly. This doesn't necessarily have to be a physical product; could be digital, could be anything. But basically, you decided to buy something. Actually, let's use an information product. You've used you bought an information product, and then there'll be this additional. Hey, for only ninety nine dollars today, you can have this other thing. That is actually a really interesting way. So you go out and find somebody that's selling something that's fully complementary to what you're selling and then say, hey, you want to tack me on as, as a post-sell upsell and I'll give you half the revenue, whatever, whatever you can afford to give them. Yeah. Huge cut because you're going to get zero otherwise. Right. And, and you have zero acquisition costs because they're going to promote this thing for you. So they're running paid ads. They're driving people into a funnel. They're converting people. And now you get to benefit from some of their conversions and yeah, they get to keep some of the proceeds. But again, if like this is a digital product, your margins are 100% so you can afford to give away 99% still make a dollar, right? So kind of doesn't matter at that point. I always hear people complain about how like uh, Amazon or eBay extracts, you know, or Etsy takes too much of a price. And I'm like, easy solve, man. Take exactly what you're paying them and go do the marketing and get customers at a lower rate of, of acquisition than they do. And you're good. Like, well, yeah, well, I can't do that. Then, dude, you're getting a discount every time. That's it. <laughs> yeah. We we actually, this came up yesterday in our Getting Customers workshop where somebody was talking about wanting to expand beyond Amazon. And I said, right. have you pushed Amazon for all it's worth? And have you tested what it will take to acquire those customers? Yeah. There were all these other soft, well, you know, but there's also the benefit of I can have direct communication. I can do this. I said, okay, to what end? What do you want them to do? Now you've got direct communication. What do you want them to do? Buy more stuff. Can you get them to buy more from Amazon? Yeah, then do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> and of course, I'm oversimplifying it. Yeah, yeah. But you know, we had a much deeper conversation. But at the end, that's what we came back to. It was like, okay, we're not done with this model yet. And this is actually pretty damn beneficial to us. Turns out when people go out and acquire all your customers for you, you will and you should pay for that. And, yeah, and if you that. don't, you'll pay more <laughs> for it to do it yourself. Okay, let's move on to stuff. Okay, so, so we've covered people. We've covered marketing. Let's cover stuff. How the hell do I pay for everything else? Okay. And that is everything from office space, which people don't have as much of an issue with, with anymore, to like just um, the basic supplies, your SaaS costs of just running a business, et cetera. Yeah. I was it. First thing that came to mind for me was SaaS costs. It's like that, that, is the, that is the office furniture of 2024. It is. I agree with that. Um, he, here's how it works the short answer is you use credit cards. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm really like, okay. Yeah. Great. That's, yeah. Didn't know that. Okay. The longer answer is, when and how do you use credit cards? In other words, what's the right spend? What's the wrong spend? Okay. Because if you understand how to use, like where and how to use credit cards, they actually make a ton of sense. And you almost can't believe like you're, you're able to get away with it. If you're spending it on the wrong things, you're like, this is idiotic. Like I, my, my bills are just getting astronomical. Like what's happening? Because there's a wrong and right way to do it. Okay. Both of them cost you money, but one of them you can never get out of. Okay. Let's start with the wrong way. <laughs> I think that's a little more important, right? The wrong way are on almost always categorically these things. People, if you are paying salaries, now I understand that you, you kind of sort of can't pay salaries directly off a credit card, right? You know, as far as kind of the mechanisms, I'm well aware of how to extract that value. Uh, Cash advances, there's, there's, there are ways to do it and they're, they're all bad. Just generally speaking, if you're paying for people on a credit card where you can't directly get that money back, it's a bad idea. Examples. Ryan, if back in the day you you and I are running our, our, our agency, that's just a cost of goods sold. If I'm paying a designer up front 
because I'm then going to go back to the client and charge for that and get paid back. That's actually just flow all over again. I'm, I'm paying up front. I'll pay later for my credit card. And that's kind of how I'll get my money back. People do it all the time, right? It's generally a pretty good use because you're paying for product that you are directly selling. It's inventory with a different name. Inventory. Exactly. Here's where people take that the wrong direction. I'm like, well, how is that any different than paying a developer to build my MVP of my product so that I can go out and sell my product and then get paid back, right? Because you have no idea that you're going to get paid back. Time frame would be <laughs> one of those. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. Now, now that again, you could make the argument to say, ah, the uncertainty exists in inventory too. If I buy 30,000 uh, t-shirts and nobody buys the t-shirts, aren't I in the same? Yes, you are. Just to be clear, right? No. Think of the money you'll save on laundry for the next 15 years. <laughs> but, but more specifically in this case, we're saying don't pay for essentially non-recoverable expenses. Rent. It's a not recoverable expense. You pay for that. You'll never see that money back, right? Anything where you keep telling yourself it's an investment, but you can't figure out how to get that money back within the next 30 to 60 days is a bad use of credit. Anything that doesn't have an obvious ROI, a known ROI, right? There will be times where we have to we have to float some stuff like marketing where we may not know it's going to work, but we're also going to be able to limit the period of time in which we we don't know that, that we know that it works and we're, we're, we're going to be able to cover that cost or we know that it doesn't work and we're not, and then we can stop. For things where, like, again, if I'm buying, uh, buying inventory and I know that I can recover because I'm going to sell the t-shirt and get my money back, I'm good. If I invest, if I put use credit and I can't sell the thing to get my money back directly, it's generally, categorically, probably a bad idea. And I've done it and I've regretted the hell out of it. Um, early in the day, like, I, I used to like, you know, basically indirectly pay for um, uh, developers or whatever on credit cards. And it was awful. It never paid back, right? Because a lot of those things are just hardcore expenses that you need a different kind of more efficient mechanism to pay for, like equity, like deferred comp, like, like some other thing that isn't cash on the barrel head on a high interest credit card. It just doesn't work. How do you slot something like SaaS into this, right? So if you're you're using... Let's say, let's do a comparison of like, you've got, you got Slack in there, you've got um, HubSpot in there, you've got um, Freshdesk or Zendesk or somebody like you got, you got some customer service. How do you, how do you factor those in? Here's how I factor them in. Number one, again, and I don't want to be callous in saying this, I don't use them until there's absolutely no other way to do it. And everyone's like, well, but, but I, but I really need that. You use the free version. You use Dude, the duct tape and bubble gum version. Use the goddamn you use spreadsheet. Google spreadsheet. Yep, yeah, yeah exactly. right? Like anybody that says it can't be done without X, I, I'm like, ah, you know what? A million people have done it without it. Anybody who says it can't be done without X was born after 2000. Let's just, <laughs> let's just be honest. Hold on. Because we, um, we all know that it can be done because we used to do it for a long time without that, any of that shit. That's right? what I'm saying. <laughs> Still um, do it without any of that shit. Like uh, time and time again, People say it can't be done without whatever. One, because they haven't tried it, or two, just because they just don't know. that you know They've never seen a world where you couldn't do it that way. Um, I'll take accounting, for example. Most reasonable people are going to be like, no, you need an accounting package. Like That's why QuickBooks exists. Ryan, we've been running for 12 years, and we have no QuickBooks, right? No Our QuickBooks. whole company's run off a friggin' spreadsheet that costs yep. zero dollars, right? Zero And it's efficient dollars. as hell, right? Yep. I don't think people are willing to question that there's another way to get something done, right? Again, a lot of it comes from lack of experience. If, if you're coming into this for the first time and you don't understand the tool set that's out there or the options, then very naturally you're going to say, well, I guess you're supposed to use HubSpot because that's what people said. Use HubSpot last. <laughs> like use HubSpot. Like once you've figured everything else out, then you eventually migrate to the gold standard, right? Um, that would be like saying, hey, um, I, I want to learn to drive I need to start with a Bentley. Yeah, I mean, you, you clearly. Know, <laughs> safety might, first. Uh, the way to start. I think part of it too is taking a look at everything that we need now operationally and saying, yes, we need this later. What it, what is the what is the scrappy, not as efficient way to do it that actually gets this moving forward? That old that old analog I keep using, it's aim for the moon, clear the fence, right? What are we going to do today to clear the fence? We don't need the dream house. We need a tent on the land. We need the most basic version that gets us to the point where we can accomplish the task at hand and nothing more, right? Like 
when you have eight expenses and zero dollars in your bank, why do you need an accounting package exactly? Right? Like, what are we accounting for? <laughs> yep, we're still poor. Ran the report again. Let's use Slack because I think it's, it's a great example. I, I love Slack. Honestly, I think it's may maybe one of the best pieces of software ever written. And I know that's a strong statement. And it's not because I'm a fanboy by any means, because we live off of it. Like, I don't, I don't know how you could build a more effective piece of software that that doesn't involve living off. With that said, to this day, we don't pay for Slack. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous even putting that in the universe, right? Uh, but a lot of people don't pay for it. Slack's we don't pay coming for, for us. If we did pay for it, it would give us things like more history. And, yeah. and we've had folks in the organization come to us and say, hey, we need to pay for Slack because we need more history. And I'm like, no, we don't. Copy whatever you need. Save it somewhere else. Problem solved, right? I'm not paying $25,000 for something. Drop it into a GDoc. Drop it into a Notion. Drop it into one of the other 50 million tools that exist to do things like record information. And we can afford it, right? <laughs> like we can afford Slack. And we're like, yeah, not going to happen. We can afford a more complex uh, accounting system. And we're like, yeah, not going to happen, right? Because we've grown up with this discipline that because it exists doesn't mean I have to have it, which I think is powerful. And it's, it's a, it, but it's, it's so, it's so tricky because I think the narratives out there are that this is what everybody's using. This is the, this is the way you do this. This is your, here's your MarTech stack. You don't think about anything else. This is what you need. This is what you have to have. Um, and it's a dangerous mentality. It's the same, it's the same challenge that you and I fight all the time around everybody thinking that they have to be a funded startup company. I have to have all of these tools so that I look like a startup company because this is what everybody else uses. One, no, you don't. Two, no, they don't. <laughs> you don't have to use it. And most of them don't. Um, you know, I think this is the, the story that gets told. But yeah, especially at the bootstrap stage, we have to just be scrappy, right? We're the MacGyvers of the startup world at this point. It's duct tape, it's bubble gum, it's, it's a candy wrapper, it's whatever, right? We just have to get the job done. Whatever tool we have, we're going to have to use, right? Well, yeah. And it, it's also being able to say, is it necessary now? Not would it be nice to have? Is it necessary? I got to be honest, you've been at this for 30 years. There's an, there's, there is not, I would say the opposite. There's not much that's necessary. There is just not. Not absolutely necessary. If we go back game show style, right? Reality television style. And you say, uh, you know, uh, man in the wild, Ryan and Will, right? You have $500 of which to start building a company, go, right? And, and forget like personal expenses for a second. I was like, man, there went 150 to ramen noodles. <laughs> but, but, but what I'm saying is like, we would look at that and we would stack rank all of our opportunities yep. and say, what can we afford? What can we defer? And what yep. I'm trying to say is, show me a startup that's like, I need all this money and I'll show you a startup that has not gone through this process. Right? Yeah, of course. No, they're just here. Here's, they build the ideal world scenario. Yep. Here's the hint, folks. You don't build startups in an ideal world. It's about the furthest thing from that. <laughs> you are Tom Hanks in Castaway. Right? You are going to make friends out of volleyballs. You're going to eat whatever you can catch, right? This is what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. But but what I'm saying, going back to stuff, right? Uh, and I'm trying to do some hard first cuts. Number one, there is very little that you need to run most businesses. Need. Want? Yes. Need? Very little. Having been through this for a very long time, I can say that with certainty. Number two, for the stuff that you absolutely need, like there is no way you can move from week one to week two without it. Put it on a credit card. Like, hey, where does the money come from? Dude, it comes from a credit card. There actually, there is no other magic thing you don't know about. There's not the payday advance of startups, right? Like, it, it's a fucking credit card, right? It's your home equity line. It's your savings account. Now, most people are like, yeah, no shit, I already knew I had those. Yeah, because that's how you pay for them. <laughs> like, it, I guess sometimes it helps to know that there actually isn't another answer. And I'm telling you, for all the little stuff. I think that's it. I think that's the most powerful thing is like that this is what it comes down to. Right? Do you want to do this or not? You don't have to play this game. You can go home. But if you want to play this game, it's going to mean pushing your chips onto the table. Right? This is what it takes. You're going to have to put some of your personal capital at risk. You're going to have to put your credit score and 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 you know your personal payments uh, history at risk. Right? This stuff happens. Um, but to your point, trim it down. Think about exactly what we need and what we don't need. And when we say need. Right. Like uh, we're talking things like, you know, if, if you want to have a website, uh, you have to host it somewhere. Right. You can't just be like, well, I'll just I'll just, you know, host it in my hands. I'll just hold it. No, you, you got to pay for that. Right. You got to have a payment processor. Right. We don't want you trying to do that. Like, OK, just mail your cash and checks to. Right. Probably not the right way to do it. Um, you could do that. You absolutely could do that. 
uh, would it slow down? But but again, you can get a payment processor for free, right? You can get these things, right? You'll you'll pay for them, but in different ways. All of the things that you're paying for monthly. My first question is always, do, do they deliver value monthly, right? I, I'll give you a simple example. Netflix does not deliver value monthly, and people are like, oh bullshit. You know, I use it all the time. Okay, cool. But Netflix delivered most, like take any streaming services, they'll deliver most of their value based on back catalog, right? For the first few months to a year. But once you burn through most of the stuff that is interesting to you, the ongoing value each month thereafter can be zero. We subscribe to like five streaming services. So we're like on, on Max, on Hulu, whatever. And every month I look at them just because I'm a founder. And I say, what is the ROI of Disney compared to what it was a year ago? When, when my kids had back catalogs to dig into. Now back catalogs exhausted. All they have to deliver now, and I'm just using this as, a, as an example, is like one shitty show a month, right? So now we're paying the same price for essentially one shitty show a month. We'd be better turning it off, waiting a year, and, and paying for it then. <laughs> There's something back catalog. I say this because most SaaS and services work the same way, right? Most SaaS is like, it was really valuable in the first few months we needed it, most vendors were very valuable in the first few months when we needed them, but that value drops off exponentially at some point, yet we keep thinking in terms of paying them on a perennial basis, right? That's That kind of discipline is what we're talking about when we're talking about startups. I, there's another, there's an interesting trap that just came to mind, and this is one of those where I think people get tricked into or convinced to pay for things before they need them. And it's this, it's this notion that well, if you don't build it right now, or if you don't start with the right infrastructure now, it'll be a lot harder to switch later. Number one, 99 times out of 100, that's just bullshit. It's not any harder to switch later. It's, there's, 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 there's a little bit of extra work there, sure. But you know what's a lot harder? Not being able to buy the other thing that you really needed because you spent money on something you didn't need now to save yourself some work in a future you don't even know exists yet because you might not make it that far because you spent money on the wrong shit today. So there, there's it's one of those things that I, I hear founders say this all the time. Like, no, we decided to you know do you know the the full full backend stack. We did, we're gonna we're gonna do it right. Neat. How's that going to help you make money tomorrow? How's that going to help guarantee that you're around next week, the week after, the week after? And the answer is always, well, it doesn't. It'll just make life easier in the future. Sorry, but fuck your future. We need to worry about right now if you're going to have a future. Your future is inconsequential if today doesn't work, if tomorrow doesn't work. Right? A month out is completely irrelevant. I hate the axiom, uh, you have to spend money to make money. I hate when people say that because they use it as a blanket, ex blanket excuse to spend money, right? As if spending money is a challenge. Yeah. To convince people to spend money they don't have in most cases, right? Like that's that's where you see this come out the most. We use the opposite. We use something called you have to make money to spend money. Yes. Right. That, that's that's actually by the way, that's where the concept came from, right? Like right. you had to give something of value to get money so that you could give money to get something of value. This is the core concept of money. It was yep. value for value exchange, and somehow we forgot that. I need to go get money so I can buy things. No, you need to make money so you can go buy it. Let's go back to our our, our faux reality show for a second. Sure. Right? We've got $500, <laughs> right? And, and and we sit down and we say, we have to make money to spend money. What do we mean? Okay. Uh, in the next episode, Ryan and Will are bartenders. Yes. <laughs> because they're trying to make money so they can generate some capital so they can go spend it on their business, yep. right? Um make money to spend money means we need to do whatever the hell we need to do now so that we can have some cash to, yep. to to make investments with we talked about this a couple episodes ago and i think it was a great it was a great discourse uh because i think that it's so many people feel like once they start the startup it has to stay on this like really fine and narrow path that just points toward that product or whatever as opposed to saying like hey i could trade my services to get this thing i need hey i could sell services just to get cash to buy something i need um, and it, it too often goes by the wayside and, and we think that like, look, it's either raise $2 million or go home. That is one way of doing it. <laughs> it's good to ensure the answer is go home. Um, if you and I were starting a taco stand, okay. And it turned out that the fat was that, yeah, we're, we're, we're bartenders by night. We're, we're selling tacos during the day. But if it turned out that we were like, dude, for the time being, we can make more money selling, um, delivering pizzas as well as selling tacos. 
then guess what? You and I are delivering pizzas. We are delivering right? pizzas. Yeah, yep, that's, that's exactly it. Whatever it takes, we have to make money to spend money. This right? is bootstrap, folks. This is what it looks like. That's what we're talking about, right? It's it's not what people think, which is I have this bolus of cash and I deploy it in such a clever way that it makes me more money. That sounds right. awesome. That Does. sounds awesome, right? Yep. Number one, it rarely works. And number two, that's usually not a situation you're going to be in, right? When we do these episodes, we're doing these episodes to break down all these bullshit myths so that you have something actionable that you can actually go do something with. If we sat here in Gary V, and this isn't even a disrespect to Gary V, but if we just said, oh, just crush it, you know, to me, that's this the same amorphous bullshit, right? Um, or, oh, just raise lots of money. Yeah, not really, right? Like, that sounds cool, but it usually does wind up where you think it does. And by the way, it's also not going to happen to you, right? So to me, that's useless advice. It is. Now, I, yeah, I, I like, I like the point. There's so many of these little traps out there, right? Like, the, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you know, uh, Spend money to make money. So you know what you have to do to make money, Will? You have to make money. You have to yeah. make money to make money. That's that's <laughs> actually to, just like it's, it's that simple, right? However you have to make it, right? How, however you have to make it. Going back to that, the story at the, at the top of the episode when we were talking about Felix Dennis, um, he was like, I had so many side hustles on how I made money to actually fund my real business and what I was trying to do that at the time, it would if you looked, at, if you snapshotted my life at that moment when I was starting whatever business I was starting, it wouldn't even look like I was starting that business. Why? Because he was busy making money so that he could spend the money again to go make money, which I, I know uh, a, a fact we're, we're hammering home pretty hard, but it's fairly important. So here's what I would say. If we zoom out and we say, what's this bootstrapping thing all about, yep. right? This bootstrapping thing is all about saying, how do I understand, number one, what I need? How do I understand, number two, the least that I need? And what are all the most efficient ways to go about acquiring that thing that ideally requires either no money or requires me paying money sometime in the future when I have some money? But if anybody's you know listening to this going, hey, all that sounds hard. Yeah, it's really hard. If you're listening to this saying, yeah, it would be easier to raise money. Of course it would. And by the way, you're probably not going to. And that's perfectly okay. What we're talking about is being disciplined about looking for all the opportunities to maximize money that you wouldn't have otherwise had. And, and silver lining to all of this, if you apply these same pr processes and mentality now, this will make you a way more efficient company if you decide to get capitalized or not. Overthinking your startup because you're going it alone? You don't have to, and honestly, you shouldn't, because instead, you can learn directly from peers who've been in your shoes. Connect with Bootstrap founders and the advisors helping them win in the Startups.com community. Check out the Startups.com community at www.startups.com to see if it's for you. Could be just the thing you need. I hope to see you inside.